when I'm working with kids, sometimes what I do, I'll walk in and I'll go, okay, let me tell you a story. And, you know, of course that gets their attention rather than me just blah, blah, blah. And I go, okay, so a skunk walks down a road. And I go, okay, did you like that story? <laughs> and they're like, uh, they're like, that's, you know, it depends on how old they are. You get different responses. Sometimes you, you immediately get someone go, that's not a story. Or, 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 or some kids think they should say yes, because I'm an adult and they don't know what to do, right? So finally, someone does say that's not a story. And I go, okay, so why is that not a story? And, there, and often the reply is, because nothing happened. And I'm like, you're right. So my name is John Ruby, and I've been working with people since 2005, helping them create more of what they really want. And usually it's a heartfelt or a calling, some kind of dream of theirs, and that often involves um, storytelling and writing. Um, and sometimes we take those same principles and just apply it to their life, and, and we'll see how we do that in a moment. Today, though, we're returning to my first love, which is uh, storytelling and writing, story structure, and this is how I actually got into the game. Um, I had written three screenplays. I had studied story structure uh, for screenplays, for script writing, for about 15 years. And in that process, I finally figured it out. Right, and I and I got it because people, some people would say a little bit here, a little bit here. I put it all together for a 60-page ebook, mostly for myself, to make sure it was really clear. And a friend who was an author, he had not written any screenplays, but he wrote a novel, and he said, "Can I read it? Because I'm thinking about turning my book into a screenplay." And I was like, "Yeah, of course. I'd love to get your feedback." So he reads it and he comes back to me and he goes, "John, this is not just story structure for a screenplay. This is story structure for stories. Period." And all of a sudden, I was like. Oh, and so then that's what opened up the possibility for me to write my novel, which was Space Fighters on Prom Day, right? Action adventure, crazy over the top. And, and I use that structure and, and in also in the past and what we're doing here today is really about the basics, story structure 101, really breaking it down. And, and I had a friend who said, hey, I'm working with some kids, we're doing some storytelling. And so I said, hey, I worked in um, a charter school for three years, uh, grade school and elementary or elementary and middle school. Um, and, and sometimes it was just storytelling with the younger kids. But when they were getting older, then it would be a little bit more beginning, middle and story arc, how to start doing that. So I said, you want to get together? And so here we are. And this information is also information that I've shared with new adult writers. Story structure is not here, I'm gonna get up close. Story structure is not here to hamper, hamper you or slow you down, getting all emotional. Uh, story structure is here to support you and the story you wanna tell. I believe that 100%, I've seen that. It doesn't matter what your story is. I've worked with people writing memoirs, which is a true story, but it's still a story. Um, and the novelist and screenwriters. And, and so story structure actually frees us up to apply our creativity and, and, and supports us. When I'm working with kids, sometimes what I do, I'll walk in and I'll go, okay, let me tell you a story. And, you know, of course that gets their attention rather than me just blah, blah, blah. And I go, okay, so a skunk walks down a road. And I go, okay, did you like that story? <laughs> and they're like, uh, they're like, that's, it depends on how old they are. You get different responses. Sometimes you, you immediately get someone go, that's not a story. Or, 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 or some kids think they should say yes, because I'm an adult and they don't know what to do, right? Which is not very nice, but it works. Um, so finally, someone does say that's not a story. And I go, okay, so why is that not a story? And, they're, and often the reply is, because nothing happened. And I'm like, you're right, that's not a story. So I say, okay, let's, do, let's go a little bit longer. Let's go, uh, skunk walks down the road and he smells this beautiful smell, just awesome food smell. He's not sure where it's coming from, but he's really hungry and his stomach rumbles. And, and then he peers over the, br the bush and he sees a picnic basket. Okay, what about that story? And then now that starts confusing him a little bit, some people, because they're like, that's kind of a story. I mean, we're moving into story realm, but that's not really a story. And so then I start explaining beginning, middle and end. Right, so we need a beginning, middle, and end, and and just for a tip, working with younger kids, um, if they're really young, like second and third grade, 
one kid one time, actually in second grade when I was there, uh, she's like, can we stand up and act out the story while you tell it? And I was like, okay, <laughs> like, I don't think there's a rule against that, right? And so, so then every time I came back to the class, everyone stood up there, the desks were in a big U. And so we had like 20 kids up. And then all of a sudden, as I was the storyteller and doing this, then I would start getting more animated, right? I'd be like, oh, and then I saw snowballs and I had to throw them and then everybody's throwing them. And, and then, then there was these lava between rocks and you had to jump between the rocks. So I'd tell it, so then everyone would be doing it because I'm like, because you know, I remember being a kid, like how many exciting moments do you have being a kid in school sometimes <laughs> or they like, someone's just blah, blah, blah. Or, or, or somebody would say, can I draw? Can I draw a picture while you, uh, of what you're drawing? So I'm like, yeah, of course, you know what I mean? Um, and that's the difference also between working with adults and kids. Adults, when they come to me, you know they wanna learn storytelling, right? They wouldn't come to me if they didn't. But with kids in a classroom, you know there's five or 10 scientists and five and 10 artists and five and 10 whatever engineers. And some of them don't, could care less about what I'm doing. And so then the idea is how to make it fun, uh, hopefully for the majority of everybody. So the basic story structure is you have a person, you have a hero and they're living a life. Then you get the hero up a tree and you throw rocks at your hero. And then at the end, the hero comes down from the tree. So that's very simple, very, that's the, like the quickest three act structure. And of course, this is act one, act two, and act three. Okay, so of course, we're going to go over that to deepen our understanding. But that's, that's basically every story ever told ever is what happens. Okay, so let's go into it. So we have a hero living his, his or her life. It cannot be horrendous. Because if it's really, really horrendous, then they're most likely going to go out and change it already. So it's sort of like, okay, blah, blah. It's not exactly what they want, right? It's Luke trapped on his planet farming. It's not terrible, but he wants to go fight with the rebels. But oh, just stay one more year. You know what I mean? It's like that, it's that trap we all get into, right? Of like, oh, this isn't so bad. I'll just stay, right? So that's, so, so that's, the, that's the hero life, right? Then hero gets up a tree. Uh, what that means is they enter a new world. Uh, they have obstacles, challenges. That's what throwing the rocks, right? And, and then there's usually a mentor. So they learn something. They learn how to avoid the rocks. They learn, they learn what they need to learn to survive the rock throwing. And then when the hero comes down out of the tree, um, then what they do is they take, and this is really key. This is key of all storytelling that we can use for ourselves and for anyone we're working with. Whatever they learned, what the hero learned while the rocks were being thrown at them, that's the information the hero uses then to succeed in act three. So this is really important. And this is the fun part with, with working with kids is then you can pull up a quote. These are the quotes that I like to use. You can use these, you can use any quotes you want. Um, one is, one is a, a quote from um, a Hollywood star, mega super big star, and one is from Albert Einstein. So, so we'll do the star one first. Uh, Chadwick Boseman, um, Boseman uh, Howard University, he did a graduation speech in 2018. He's the actor who played Black Panther in the Marvel Universe. And his quote is, purpose is an essential element of you. It is the reason you are on this planet at this particular time in history. Your very existence is wrapped up in the things you are here to fulfill. Whatever you choose for a career path, remember, now this is the really important part, the struggles along the way are only meant to shape you for your purpose. So the struggles along the way are only meant to shape you for your purpose. What he's talking about is act two, right? We're not gonna have random struggles. We're not gonna have Luke Skywalker isn't gonna learn how to swim in the middle on the Death Star, because that's not, because that does not play out, right? He's gonna learn how to use the force. So then when he's up against the Death Star, Luke used the force, right? That makes sense that what he learned here, he then uses here to succeed, right? So, so that's, what, that's what Chadwick's talking about, that the, 
that the challenges we have in our life are shaping us and helping us so we can fulfill our purpose. And then Albert Einstein says it with a lot less words. He says, we cannot solve our problems with the same, same thing we used when we created them. Okay, so we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking that we used when we created them. So the hero, so what that really means, and this points out really well, and this is important because I'll, I'll tell you, adults and children often do this slightly incorrect, and they do it two different ways, and I'll get into that in a moment. But what that means is the consciousness of this, the hero here that succeeds is not the same as this person. This person could not achieve this. That's really important. This person, if you bypass act two and you drop them here, cannot achieve the goal because they haven't gone through this. What adults sometimes make the mistake is they, think they know who the person is at the end and then they drop them in the beginning. But they're too wise, they're too confident, they're too, you know what I mean? You, there's no arc. It's, it's just like it's, they're going through a dark forest, they're going through challenges, but they're the same person. So that doesn't really, there's no growth because they're already evolved or something like that, however the word you want to use it. Um, the kids, on the other hand, sometimes just have this, the, I mean, I guess it's the same thing, but in reverse, they have the hero here and they just move through the challenges and they end up here, right? And, and they don't have this aha moment because, um, so, so, so is there any questions at the moment? Is that beginning to make sense? I think it's, it's fascinating in the way you've simplified it. It's, it's an aha, mo aha moment for me, for sure. <laughs> it's like, yeah. oh yeah. And I think one of the, the ways that I struggle when I'm writing a story is that I'm too nice to my characters <laughs> in act two. Right. Too nice to the hero. I'm just, I think I'm too nice of a person. I don't want to throw rocks. I don't want right. to throw rocks at the, at the hero. So. Right, right. And, and that's great. I'm glad you said that. And yes, other people sometimes do that too. But that is, um, and now, now you can see how important it is. And for two reasons, actually. It's when we see Harry Potter living underneath the stairs, our heart opens to him. Mm. So that's a really, it's a really powerful way that writers manipulate readers or viewers, if you're talking about movies and TV. They, they manipulate it because it's, it's really easy in that you just have a, a character go through a hard time and we immediately connect with them. Game of Thrones did that at one point, Jamie, which- Here's a picture of Jamie Lannister. You can see that, that smug look of the actor's face. Uh, he's a really terrible character. No one despicable, no one liked him at all. Um, and then through the manipulation by the author and the creators of just one hardship after another, uh, we ended up liking him. Um, at one point, one hardship after another started happening, and I was like, oh, you're going to make me like him. I could see it coming. I knew <laughs> what they were doing, and I was like, Oh, I hate this guy and you're going to manipulate. And it was true. After about five episodes, I was rooting for him and I, I saw it coming. So, so it's a powerful thing. All right. So, so let's take this a little further. So, so I often go in layers if I'm working with kids or for first time writers. It's so, so the, so, so hero, hero and tree comes down. Then we start explaining it. Oh, this is, um, you know, plain old world. Act two is going into a new world. And so act two is often symbolic of all the fairy tales of going into a dark forest. So it's not only a new world, but it's a dangerous new world. And it's tricky, right? So, so that's there. And then the midpoint is always the bad guy is worse than we thought. So we knew the bad guy was bad and it was gonna give him hard times. And the way this often plays out in films is, oh, the bad guy doesn't just wanna steal money from the bank. Um, he's going to also then blow up the bank afterwards and take out half a block. And now that's gonna cause a lot of disaster and panic so then he can escape. 
right? So now it's not like, oh, he just wants money. Now he's going to hurt people or something bigger than that. So, so in a story, and I usually don't go into this with the whole level with kids or depending on what grade they are, right? We have to figure out what we want to tell them. And we'll, we'll get back to a simpler approach for them. But, but the midpoint, bad guy's worse than we thought. The hero then learns about that. And then that actually drives the rest of the story. So when, next time you're watching a movie or television or reading a book, you'll often see there's more time in the first half. But then when we hit the midpoint, it then takes place over two days or four days or seven hours. It drives it to, and then it picks up the pace, right? And this is often, this, this is the part that I often do include with kids is this often is a place to introduce a ticking clock. So a ticking clock, old time face, right? What that is is, oh, Cinderella and the ball, right? Oh, at midnight, you're going to turn back the pump. K's stagecoach is going to turn back into a pumpkin, right? The glass slippers, uh, I guess the glass slippers stay, but everything else changes, right? So, so now there's a sense of urgency, a sense of time. Oh, the, 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 the timer on the bomb is ticking. Oh, the deadline for the hostage, whatever that is. So that drives it forward, right? Or, or the, the moon's going to come up and someone's going to turn into a werewolf. Right. So those are all the ticking clock things to to go. OK, the hero can't sit down and wait. This is no waiting. This is go, go, go. Right. So we've got a ticking clock. And then this is the, the line, the, the second act between second and third act, where the hero then right here needs to be a different person here. And so in in story structure terms, at the end of second act is often called um, there's there's a death often. So sometimes there's a physical death, like Obi-Wan Kenobi dies, okay? And that has a dual purpose. I thought maybe it has more purpose than that. The dual purpose that I'm aware of is, one, um, it really shows the hero and the audience that the stakes are high, right? Like, like if someone actually dies, you're like, oh, geez, like sort of takes me out of this funk of, oh, everyone's just all going to get by and get by. The other part, at least in Star Wars with Obi-Wan, that's the mentor, so, so in a way, if the mentor didn't die, he might have come back and he would have been the one that blown up the Death Star, right? So it's sort of passing the baton. So, so the mentor dies and now Luke has to step up. So, so there's an actual death there, but in many stories, there may not be an actual death, but whether there's always has to be a death is the death of how the hero used to act. Okay, and so now this is the fun part that I often wrap in with coaching or working with kids is this, has to, this happens with all writers and all people achieving a goal, right? We, haven't, we have a life that we haven't really been achieving the goal we've been thinking of, right? And then at some point we make a decision, okay, let's go for it. And in screenwriting terms, that, that's actually really right around page 22, believe it or not, like, like right off the nose, because <laughs> it's, it's bizarre. You start watching movies and you'll be like, holy geez. So, 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 where, so let's go back here for a second. So, so the first act, heroes living the life, then they have a calling, right? Or they have an idea. Now, the first thing they often do is they, um, they, they, we learn, they have an idea, I wanna do this, Olympics, write a book, go fight Darth Vader, whatever that is. Then immediately what happens is, and, and Joseph Campbell says this very clearly in the hero's journey is, is the refuse, refusing the call. Oh no, I can't do that. Oh, I'm not worthy. Oh, I'm not skilled enough. Oh, oh I'm not smart enough. Oh, this is too big of a project. Oh, I'll, I'll never do it right. Right, very human, right? Every, people are laughing. Right? <laughs> right. I don't understand, John. I've never, I, I, don't, I don't understand. Yeah. <laughs> I, <know. laughs> I right. wish. I didn't understand. Yes. <laughs> no. Well, that, and and the reason, and that's everyone. That's what's so. That's what's so awesome about story structure and storytelling, is, at times, if we want to, and if we're aware of it ourselves, and we're working with someone, 
we can do that whole metaphysical thing of like, oh, you're working on this, but really we're talking about your life and I'm talking about my life and we're talking about every, it's, it's pretty amazing, right? So, so living their life, have an idea immediately, refusal, I can't do this, it's too big, it's, you know, I'm not worthy. So then, then what happens is they make a decision, right? Because if they didn't make a decision, there would be no story, right? So they have to make a decision, then they enter this new world. Usually this is where they have an ally or friend, right? Um, Harry Potter's got Hagrid, you know, bringing the letters and he finally talks to him and he explains it and then takes him to Diagon Alley, which is a kind of a spooky place to buy their potions and wands. Um, and this is where also, um, depending on how much you wanna talk and, and share with people, it's very helpful here to have someone, so, so the hero usually doesn't know, okay? Doesn't know the new world because they're going into a new world. It's a new world to them, right? But the hero often has a uh, mentor, I'm just gonna do a men, M, that does know the new world. And that's really for two purposes. One, to escort them into the world and move the story on, but it's really for all the readers and all the people watching the movie. Because that way Harry Potter can ask, what is this? And Hagrid can answer it. And really that's telling everybody reading, right? So Hermione would never ask Haggard certain things because Hermione was raised in that world, right? So you can understand that's why we need Luke who knows nothing about the rebels and we need Harry Potter who knows nothing. And, and if your hero is, knows more, then that's when you possibly throw in a new character that doesn't so then the hero can explain it to them, right? Uh, and, and then explain it to the rest of the audience. So we got the new world, uh, regular life, an idea, refusing the call, making a decision, right, then going into the new world. Um, then, then, the, then a bunch of stuff happens, and we don't really have time to get into every point on here. But what happens is hardships, problems, obstacles, right, and, and it gets worse and worse and worse, and then at the middle, oh my gosh, the bad guy's so bad, Darth Vader is gonna blow up the whole planet. You know, this is that, that all the rebels are on. Not only are they evil, but this is really bad. Now all my friends are gonna be gone. So now it's personal, right? And so then um, we continue on and then we go into act three and act three is Luke really has to let go of this whole farm boy stuff. And he has to let go of, of not being aware of the force and he taps into the force and hears it and then shoots the bullet at the right time and blows up the Death Star or however we do that. And, and there's two things that usually happen here. One is the Luke has to um, demonstrate, uh, and I'll tell you the cheesy horror fix of what they do, but the, the person has to demonstrate that they've actually learned what they've learned and use that here. And then what happens is usually the bad guy comes back one more time to push against them. And then they have to demonstrate it one more time. The, the way it's done in action films often or even horror movies is they kill the big bad monster and then, oh my gosh, it wasn't dead and it pops up one more time, right? Like we haven't seen that like a billion times, right? Or, but when it's done subtly in drama films, it's, um, there's this one romantic comedy that I use in, in the ebook is that he has to learn how to stand up for himself. And so he does, and he does it clearly. He doesn't do it yelling and screaming. He stands up, he says, no, we're gonna do this, gonna do this. And then a few, just as next scene later, the bad guy who's like this evil conniving person, and that's a little strong, but, but evil conniving person, and, and she pushes him one more time. And then he says, hold on, takes her out of the room and just says, no. I'm gonna be here with so-and-so, this is who I love, this is where I belong. And, and he really showed, cause, cause if it's done right, if this is done right, the whole audience should, should, should hold their breath. They should be like, oh, did he really learn it? Is he gonna crumble? Is he gonna go back and be this person back here? Like we're like, we're not even sure if it's done well enough. And then when he finally steps forward, we're like, oh, he stood up for himself, right? So in action films, it's, it's usually much less subtle. And, you know, they either kill the bad guy and then the right-hand person, you know, they, he comes sneaking around the back or something and then he has to stop them too or something like that. So, so that's, 
that's a quick, simple overview of story structure. Is that, is that something do you think you can work with or how, what doors does that open up for you either with helping other people or your own story? I think that helps me with both my own stories and um, the children that I work with. Um, I don't think I've ever seen story structure explained in a way that I understood so well. <laughs> I mean, it was really great. Yeah. I want the ebook. I want it now. Yeah. So. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> Some of the stories that I've written have been, they're more, they, I want to encourage and inspire and they're more um, beautiful and spiritual and mm -hmm. all that. And, and, and then so I think, okay, it is for children or the child inside. And then I come up against that wall of how, but I know mm -hmm. that there needs to be, you know, the bad guy. Yeah. Yeah. And, and how to do that, um, that's still, like, I, I'm not sure. Sure. Like, how to do it without making it too scary. One hundred, I totally get it. I got two kids. <laughs> Helpful for you, and, and yeah. you let me know. The, it's, it's the bad guy then shifts into a coach. So it's, it's either something situational or a person that pushes basically anybody that pushes us we often consider to be bad even if they're doing it for our benefit right no, just i i got yeah yeah so so right so that's so that's that's one you think you can do that that sometimes i work with writers and we can always talk about this later but but the way you can work backwards sometimes if you want to some people like to work is find out what you want the message here yeah. right and then just real and then walk it backwards right so if, so if luke is going to be a jedi and use the force to succeed then at the very beginning he can't be a jedi and he can't know anything about the force right you can you can work it backwards so if, if, if at the end is everybody loves everybody well then probably everyone doesn't love each other at the beginning if at the end is i feel confident to uh, move on my heartfelt goals and dreams, well, then probably you did. the hero yeah. isn't feeling so confident in the hero. And so then, so then the bad guy can come along and say, be confident, or look how wonderful you are. And then the person has to, so it's not bad as in with an ax, right, or a gun, yeah. but it's bad as in you're better than who you think you are. And the person's like, oh, no, I'm no, not. No, I'm not. Yeah, right. so it's the inner struggle. Of right, it. right. Okay. But, but, but on the very grounds of the story, it has to be played out on the outer. Yeah. Right, yeah. That's, that's, that's always the thing. It is an inner struggle, but we need to see it on the outer. The one other thing I would say about working with kids then is just have fun. You know, uh, I, often they, they would then write a story and, and we'll act it out or I'll play it out as they get older and then adults obviously then it starts breaking it down into you know beginning middle and end and and all of that um and then it also just comes down obviously to the individual right some kids are going to do it just to have fun some you know once in a while you hit somebody that's like i want to do this so i want to learn that and then i can go a little bit more um right. with with adults this then right then i have an ebook right that really breaks down there's actually 12 um there's 12, um, I, I call them story structure um, points. And, and, and there's, so that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. And, and so then obviously we don't have time to go into that here. And it would also just be a lot of information, but it's information that really goes, okay, how do we move from the beginning to the middle? What really happens at the, in the middle um, so, so I'll just give you one more tip just to give you an idea and for people who are watching this, like what that is. So what's really neat is what happens at this point, um, which is before the midpoint, after the thing, it's called a metaphor scene. So this would be something I would never bring up with the kids, right? This is way too much, but, but for next time you're watching a movie, it happens usually around the 45 minute mark. And the simplest way to see it is um, in Star Wars, since we've been talking about this, this is when Luke is on the Millennium Falcon and he's got the blind shield on, right? And he's got the labor lightsaber out for the, um, 
and that little globe thing is shooting bolts at him, right? And and Han Solo's like, oh, force doesn't exist. I've been all over the universe. There's no one thing, kid. And then o Obi-Wan goes, hey, Luke, why don't you put the shield down and use the force? He's like, I can't do that. I'll go ahead and do it. So he puts it down and lo and behold, boom, boom, boom. He blocks the, the things, right? So what this <laughs> metaphor, and then in romantic comedies, just to give you a comparison, and that's what the ebook does. It, it takes three very different movies. One's an action adventure, one's a romantic comedy, one's this quirky independent film, but all of them made millions of dollars. I mean, they're all solid, big, critically acclaimed films. But in romantic comedies, what often happens is the hero and um, the love interest, either she with him or him with her, or maybe him with him, her with her, right? It's 21st century. They dance. It's often symbolic. So they dance for the first time. But then what happens is um, if they danced and there wasn't another obstacle, that would be the end of the book. That would be the end of the movie, right? <laughs> but what happens is the mother comes in, the ex-girlfriend comes in, something comes in and breaks them up. Or, oh my gosh, the other person is actually dating someone already, right? So that breaks them up. But the metaphor scene with Luke using the lightsaber and the force and, and the dancing, when at the end then, when Luke hears Obi-Wan's voice and it says, hey, use the force, because this scene exists, everyone in the audience goes, oh, that makes sense. He can use the force. Do you hear what I'm saying? Without that scene, Obi-Wan coming into the cockpit knowing Luke used the force makes no sense. It'd be like, where did that come from? That came out of left field, right? That was, and, and same with then when they finally get together, it's like, oh, I always knew they'd get together, right? And we don't even consciously often remember this scene. That's where it's so beautiful. The writer, see, that's the shift between being a consumer and the creator. When we consume books and movies, we just enjoy it, right? We enjoy it consciously, subconsciously, it all comes together. When we become a creator, just like if we're gonna become a chef, right? I can eat really wonderful food, enjoy it. But when I become a chef, I better better know what cinnamon does, right? I better know what a little too much flour does, right? Because that's my ingredients and I'm doing it. When I'm consuming, I'm like, ah, oh, that tastes good. What's in it? I don't know, it tastes good, <laughs> right? You don't need to... And same with being a writer. As a writer, it's like stepping back and seeing all these different parts so then I can do that to get where I want in the story and then manipulate again is kind of a strong word, but to manipulate the reader and, and the viewer, which they want to be. They want to enjoy a story. They want to enjoy the emotions. They want to enjoy the adventure, have had the ahas. And so, and so that's what the ebook does. It, it takes into each of these so we can really clearly get that. Um, and, and, and then so, fantastic, if that's, works for you and this is enough information to do what you need to do fantastic um, if you want more the more that i have is the the 60 page ebook and i call it um or at least at the moment i call it you'll see it somewhere on the screen here uh, story structure is your friend use it right and that's the one that it takes the three movies and and really goes through and breaks them down so people can really understand it so, and then the, then if you want more and those in what you're looking for i have an online creativity group called Let's Create Tuesday. A lot of writers participate. And it's, uh, we don't specifically talk about writing, but what we do talk about is creativity and inspiration. We have actual writing time, and then we connect and answer questions about whatever creative challenges you may be having. And the report from other writers is, as they tune in every Tuesday, then they start writing more and their creativity and productivity increase. So you can learn about that. And of course, there's one-on-one uh, -on -one coaching if you're interested and other authors support. All right, so do you guys have any other questions or thoughts? It's fabulous. I, yeah, no, really, it, it, I, I, I feel like I want it in a you know, written form so I can actually go back and yeah. remember it because yes. I didn't take that many notes but because uh, I was engaged in yeah. listening. But I also kept flashing on Hallmark movies, mm -hmm. <laughs> which are one of my, like, I'm just going to zone out and watch this silly sure. romantic comedy <laughs> or, or whatever it is. And, yeah. and um, the arc, the, the metaphor to the, like, I know 
I already had been noticing certain yes. structure, yep. but now I will. Um, oh, you'll really see it. Yeah, because yeah. I already have was like, I'm getting a little bored. They, I know what's going to happen. It's, you know, yeah. I know what the end's going to be. It's going to be a nice ending. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, but the metaphor, like knowing those pieces, that's interesting. Yeah. So. yeah. Yeah, and, and, and when you go into it even further, it is really, it can be really fun. Like sometimes now when I watch movies, um, I totally forget about it. But every once in a while, I mean, unless I'm specifically looking for it, but if, but if it's good enough and I get swept up into it, I'm totally on board. But every once in a while, I'll see a scene and then I'll, I'll hit pause or pull up the thing to see where we're at in it. And my family's <laughs> like, play the movie. And I'm like, no, that's the midpoint. I'm like, no, we just went into act three. Cause do you understand the death of the old way had to happen? And they're like, I don't care. I, I'm, I'm going to be like, oh, this is the, how far are we on is this is the metaphor, you know, or, right. like, yeah. or this is the calling. This is page 22. Right. Like, right. <laughs>